Thank you so much, Mitchell. And thank you for the invitation. I am so excited to be here. This has been such a great start to National Public Health Week and such an invigorating conversation so far. Um, like Mitchell said, my name is Jonaida Rivera. I go by Joni and I'm an assistant professor of communication at uh, Rutgers School of Communication and Information. But I am a trained and true public health scholar. I have my MPH and my PhD are both in public health. So I feel really excited to be speaking to my people today. Um, and to be following two amazing speakers, what great presentations so far with such important and relevant topics uh, to what is happening in the United States and in the world today. And I am going to be adding to the conversation by focusing on the Latino community, which is a community that I am personally a part of and one of the communities that I work and advocate for. Um, and what I am going to do today is hopefully share some insights and from my experiences as a researcher, but also as a practitioner in my previous life uh, with the Latino community and ways that we can take into account um, the roles that we have as practitioners um, and researchers and communicators and how we can leverage trust within different communities using the Latino community as, a, as a, an example and a starting point for a conversation. So I'm personally from Puerto Rico. So uh, this, this entire topic and working with the Latino community has always been something incredibly important to me. And it's really important just from the fact that Latinos are really growing as a minority population in the US, uh, we account for over half of the country's population growth, and it is also a very big group of um, New Jersey residents, right? As Naishan was mentioning prior to this, Latinos represent over 20, almost 21% of the community here in New Jersey. So it's a very important group. It's a very diverse and heterogeneous group. Um, so it's important that we acknowledge that there are a lot of differences, but that, that there are also some commonalities within the Latino Latino culture that um, are, are important for us to consider when we are approaching um, different segments of the Latino community with information that can help improve their quality of life and health outcomes. Um, some of which we've just seen now with, with COVID um, and all of the different social determinants of health we see impacting the Latino community that have existed since met, way before COVID emerged. So as I mentioned, I have a previous history of uh, working in the field and I want to share three, just three of many, right? Uh, different recommendations and considerations that I have learned from my work and my research in the field with how to adequately engage with Latino communities and make sure that we are um, leveraging the infrastructures that are already in place and the work that we've already done as public health, um, as a public health workforce for a long time. And I want to start by talking about the importance of partnering with local organizations and community leaders in bottom up outreach efforts as we approach different public health issues. And I'm I'm, I'm excited that both speakers prior to me have touched upon this. I'm going to talk about this within the context of Hurricane Maria, which happened in Puerto Rico back in 2017. Um, as probably many of you uh, very well remember, this was a Category 5 storm that hit the island in September of that year, September 20th, and it had some island-wide devastation happen. Um, without going into too much detail, right? There was in, um, damage to so much infrastructure. Roads were blocked. It made it very difficult to reach impoverished communities and rural communities in the island. Um, a lot of people lost their homes. Power was lost for 100% of the island. Many people didn't have power for over six months after the storm passed. And many people lost access to running water. Um, however, I would argue that one of the most crippling damages to the island's infrastructure and being able to get assistance was the fact that the communication system collapsed. Uh, it left 
most of the island without communication for weeks and it made it very difficult to get assistance to the island but also Puerto Ricans in the diaspora right especially those here in the US um, it was very difficult to identify to find out what was happening in the island and social media actually played a really huge role in this um, I mentioned social media because it is uh, part of the, the my line of research really focuses on how we can use social media platforms as a way to engage with, mobilize, and educate different communities um, about many issues that impact their health. And in the context of Hurricane Maria, Facebook and WhatsApp were instrumental in being able to organize and mobilize. And here are just some examples of different ways that organizations in the island and outside of the island were trying to get um, assistance and leverage resources to help people in the island that didn't have access to many um, immediate and acute disaster relief efforts, but also things at a protracted lens. And I remember at the time I was uh, conducting my doctoral studies and this became the most important part of my life at that moment. Uh, and I was able to connect with other public health, engineering, uh, medical practitioners within the Johns Hopkins community where I was at at the time. And we started a grassroots group called Puerto Rico Stands um, as members of the diaspora, where among the things we wanted to do was really educate and continue to build awareness to the needs that were happening in the island. But also we wanted to be able to have the efforts that we had, collective um, skill sets that we had as public health and other medical practitioners to assist, knowing that this really um, is something that's very difficult to do from far away. So what we did as a group was identify a community within Puerto Rico that had been incredibly affected by the storm. This is an area in Puerto Rico that was in the center of the island, very impoverished. Um, as you can see pictures here, this is Sector Mana in the area of Barranquitas, Puerto Rico. A lot of people lost their homes. They had incredible structural damage. And we wanted to help them identify what we could assist them with, right? When we think about public health and working with a community, community-based work is instrumental. And even though we were Puerto Rican, we are Puerto Rican, we knew that we were not a part of this community and it was important that we were listening to what the needs were for our community members and community leaders to help establish trust to then be able to do things with them for them. And one of the things that community leaders that we reached out to mentioned was at the time, this was around um, the holidays in Puerto Rico, we celebrate Three Kings Day, which is um, a very rich Puerto Rican and Latin American tradition after Christmas. And the community member said, you know, we want it, we actually want an activity where yes, we need donations, but we have mental health issues. People are burnt out, community leaders are burnt out, and we just want something to ha bring happiness and joy to the community. So we uh, partnered with other local organizations, mental health providers and mental health nonprofits to do some mental health activities, but also bring gifts to the children in the community and use that as a springboard to really start establishing this long-term trust with community members so that we could um, then use our skill sets to address the issues that they were identifying. So that was this, the starting point for a lot of this work that we did with the community. And we were able to get um, a grant from the Bloomberg American Health Initiative at the time to collaborate with the community leaders in Sector Mana so that we could um, help them not only have a community needs assessment that was comprehensive to identify long-term disaster relief efforts that we could assist them with, but then use that um, community needs assessment to help them identify project plans that they could lead and continue to develop infrastructure for. Uh, I am going to share in the chat afterwards and in the slides at the end links to all of these different tools and these different things. So um, don't worry about that. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but we did go door to door with the community and we let the community leaders actually lead us 
to the different areas in the community to conduct this needs assessment. We identified and addressed a lot of public health issues that the community leaders were particularly interested in exploring and expanding on. And we use this community needs assessment to report back to the community. We had capacity building workshops with um, members of the community for them to see the results of their own needs assessment and develop priorities together to focus their efforts and organization moving forward. As, an organ as a grassroots group, we then committed to helping them develop a community disaster preparedness plan where we not only were able to get satellite phones for community leaders in case they lose communication again, but also help them with organization so that they could continue to foster um, different events and different um, outreach efforts in the community if disasters like this continue to happen, which of course it's, it's an island um, and with climate change, we, we know that these things are, are going to happen again. Um, but I want to stress how important it was for us to let the community leaders really take the lead in what they needed and we as practitioners helping use our skill sets to guide the infrastructure so that they were doing um, a better job at coalescing. And we really leverage social media what's app in particular to coordinate a lot of these efforts on the ground, given that a lot of us in Puerto Rico stands are not a part of the physical community. We live outside of, of the island. Um, and these different platforms that community leaders were already comfortable with using were instrumental in facilitating all of this, which has also led to future continuous collaborations with COVID and onward. I also wanted to, before jumping to the next point that I want to make, highlight another resource that is just really re-emphasizing the messages that you've heard um, so far today. We do not need to be reinventing the wheel. We need to work with communities who've already established themselves as trustworthy sources and leaders to really recover for COVID and beyond. This particular um, effort by a working group on equity in COVID-19 vaccination led by Communivax and the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security has some great resources. And again, I'll make sure that these are available in the chat. So of course, <laughs> we've been talking um, about COVID-19 and the pandemic and our keynote speaker so eloquently um, discussed how we are living in an infodemic. We are dealing with misinformation as a huge public health threat. Uh, and I want to focus a little bit on how we can think about establishing and reestablishing trust within communities through efforts to counteract misinformation by things that we already know work and we have seen work in health communication and public health for a really long time, um, particularly the use of culturally tailored narratives as a way to combat and counteract misinformation. Now, within the Latino community, I wanna highlight that uh, social media is a really big resource. Uh, social media, Latinos are avid consumers of social media for a myriad of, of topics. And in mid-pandemic, mid-first mid year, so August 2020, Nielsen actually uh, published a report that showed that Latinos were 57% more likely to use social media platforms as a primary source of information about coronavirus compared to non-Hispanics, right? So this, it, these are platforms that are very important in part and probably expanded uh, or elevated because of the pandemic, um, because a lot of Latinos use these platforms to communicate with family members within and outside of the United States. And as uh, public health practitioners wanting to reach minority or audiences or other underrepresented groups on social media, it's important that we understand their utilization patterns because different groups are going to use different social media platforms for different reasons and in different rates. To highlight that, I just wanted to show here some statistics 
for some of the most used social media platforms in the US, Facebook um, in particular, it's 69% of the general US population uses Facebook. Um, meanwhile, Latinos, Latinas, and Latinx uh, folk use it 72% of the time. WhatsApp, completely different numbers. While 16% of non-Hispanic whites use WhatsApp, this is an incredibly popular social media platform among Latinos, accounting for 46% of users. Uh, we also see that YouTube is huge, as are Instagram, right? And people are using these different plat platforms for different things to communicate with different parts of their identity, including family, which makes some of these platforms even more important that we have a presence on to combat misinformation because they are spaces where individuals are using the platform to communicate with individuals that they already deem trustworthy, have close family ties to, close friends, which might make um, misinformation that's shared by these individuals more difficult to address if we're not constantly doing so to curtail some of that misinformation. So um, I actually want to talk a little bit of about some of the research that I have done. And this actually also happened prior to COVID-19, reemphasizing what our keynote mentioned that misinformation is not new. And we have been tackling these issues in public health for a while. Now it's just a mainstream topic, which makes it that much more important for us to get right. Um, and some of the work that I did prior to uh, joining faculty at Rutgers was looking at how Latinos engage with cancer prevention and screening information on Facebook in particular. And the study has been published in the Journal of Health Communication. And among the findings that I wanna highlight today is that a lot of Latinos or, or the Latinos that I was uh, speaking to were really engaging with content that wasn't necessarily evidence-based, right? And that becomes problematic when there are different facets of culture and your identity that are helping you make sense of some of the information that you're consuming. And one of the things that I wanted to look at is the role of engagement with health information on social media and how it is that different Latinos are, are navigating these spaces. We tend to use social media a lot in public health, especially as public health organizations and practitioners. We want to make sure that we are giving people access to adequate information in these spaces. And engagement with this content is really important because it is an, a an incredibly important precursor to things we know are going to impact behavior change, such as increasing awareness, increasing knowledge, and ultimately helping people change their behavior towards preventive types of messages. In my work with cancer, we see a lot of uh, organizations have a Facebook presence and a presence on other social media platforms, which is really important because as I mentioned, there's a lot of misinformation on these platforms as well. However, for people to get access to this information, they either have to be following our pages or have someone in their network who's following or disseminating information from those pages. Um, and of course we can have organic or paid advertising, but that makes it really difficult sometimes for individuals to get the information that we're trying to put out there um, when there's so much misinformation that is competing for their attention. There are different models that really talk about how engagement is composed of a lot of different things. And again, this gets to really understanding your audience, understanding why Latinos are on Facebook in this example, how they present themselves, how they engage with content in ways that we can see, but also in ways that maybe we can't measure, like watching a video or sending a post to them to themselves or someone else on another platform through different sharing um, affordances on these platforms, right? So it's really important that we understand what's happening here. In addition to taking into account the fact that we are using 
these platforms as a way to communicate many times with individuals who are in our networks who share similar values and identities as us um, within the Latino community. Although none of these are in exclusive to the Latino community, they are important to uh, the Latino community and important for us to understand if we are developing messages to that really resonate with Latinos values like familismo, which really gets to the importance that we put in our family relationships, as well as personalismo, which gets to how we relate to other friends and how we like to share information in ways that are jovial and to make sure that the people that we that are a part of our network have access to accurate things. Uh, and but then we also want to think about uh, more of these patriarchal values that have been instilled in um, Latin America because of colonialism and religion, et cetera, such as machismo, marianismo, which are gender roles that get, um, definitely we can see in, in how people decide to communicate and who makes decisions in the family. Similarly, fatalism, a lot of ideas about cancer in particular that might be fatalistic. And how do we understand the way that different Latino audiences might be taking these values and using them as they're making decisions and engaging with content on social media? So among a bunch of the different um, findings and the work that I've done, the one that I wanted to highlight today is really that when we are online and we are consuming information, um, we need to take into account that a lot of times people aren't on a place like Facebook to necessarily engage with health content. So when they're scrolling, they might not be in what we as uh, communication scholars want people to be processing information centrally, right? Really paying a lot of attention. And if they see content that they are not sure of, we want them to go verify whether or not the information they're consuming is in fact accurate and where those sources are coming from. That doesn't happen a lot of the time. And I saw that in my research because a lot of times people are scrolling really fast and they go off of what we call heuristics or cues that we use to make sense of whether or not what we're seeing actually may be credible or may be accurate. And some people go off of things like seeing if a post is viral, if a lot of people like it, maybe looking at logos and names as a cue for um, accuracy or veracity. But a lot of things that I saw in the interviews that I've done with participants that are Latino is that there is a definitely the role of culture in how we interpret the kind of information that we might be engaging with, despite a lot of it being not evidence based. And we're pulling from our culture and our relationships and our identity to use some of those inferences and cues. So maybe we're looking at previous knowledge that was shared from our grandma or our family members or elements from my identity as a Puerto Rican or as a woman or as a Spanish speaker to make sense of whether or not something is credible. And here's an example, it's an extreme case um, that I've encountered in my work, but it is an example of how misinformation kind of leverages some of these things. In this scenario, I had a participant who was a Spanish preferring Puerto Rican female talking about how she saw a video from a person she thought was a physician, he's not a physician, claiming that mammograms actually cause breast cancer. And she talked to me about how this person was Puerto Rican like her, spoke Spanish, was eloquent. She deemed him a credible source so much so that she canceled her mammogram, right? This is not COVID, this is something that's cancer, which by the way, is a leading cause of death among Latinos in the United States, right? It is a huge health, uh, there, there are huge health disparities uh, related to cancer, yet we're seeing information that is maybe leveraging these different uh, parts of your identity to get people to change their behavior um, with, with potentially negative outcomes. So of course, 
I mentioned earlier that we don't need to be reinventing the wheel. And we know in public health and in health communication, the importance of tailoring and tailoring based on cultural, um, culturally important facets uh, when we develop campaigns and when we develop health communication and education efforts that are targeting specific audiences. And I wanted to share an example of a group that has done this in a wonderful way. Researchers um, in California developed a DVD called Tamale Lessons, um, which in a nutshell, in um, Los Angeles County, cervical cancer rates are very high among Mexican American women and Latinas generally. Um, and they developed a narrative and non-narrative version of uh, cervical cancer prevention and pap smear education, HPV vaccine education campaign for these women. They actually saw that the narrative version, which they created using telenovela stars, and they developed by accounting for a lot of the different cultural values and myths related to cervical cancer that exists within the community, they were able to raise um, in, in this control, in the experimental arm, rates of cervical cancer screening from 35% to 83%, which is huge, huge, huge. So again, when we're thinking of how we can develop strategies to counteract and curtail misinformation that's being spread on social media, we really need to be thinking about culturally tailoring materials, information, and ideally in the form of narratives, which grab people's attention in a space like social media where there's a lot of scrolling um, and you, you wanna make sure that people are paying attention. And I know that the speaker after me, Nick is going to be talking more about how we can do this um, effortlessly, effortlessly on social media with different health campaigns. Then the last point that I wanted to make, again, getting to trust and getting to not reinventing the wheel, is we really want to be utilizing the people that are on the ground, the people that are already trustworthy figures in delivering evidence-based messages to the community. In the Latino community, we use promotores or community health workers a lot. They are very effective and very trusted. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of other trustworthy figures. So I want to talk a little bit about how that has been done in the past in some of my work. Um, but first, I do want to highlight in the same research that I was mentioning earlier, uh, where I was exploring how Latinos engage with content related to cancer prevention and screening, uh, I saw that if not um, more, it was just as important as the content, if not more important than the content, who was sharing it. And that is something that we know and we have seen with misinformation and, and misinformation cascades now with COVID, posting sources matter, right? Who is delivering information is incredibly important uh, as a way to leverage trust that already exists in the community to help us with our public health efforts. And in my work, I saw that perceptions of expertise or authority, interpersonal relationships, and of course, alignment with my identity as a Latina, Puerto Rican, woman, et cetera, all of those things were important. And I have an excellent example of an, a community activist who's Venezuelan in the Tampa area where I did my research, uh, who came up in a lot of my interviews and people kept stressing how instrumental it was that he is the person who is delivering information about events and about um, cancer prevention and screening within the Tampa area to Latino audiences because when he talks, people listen. So it's really important that we leverage those resources that are already in the community to make sure that we are disseminating content uh, from people who already have that trust. And I wanted to give another shout out and example to some of the work that I did in my previous days before um, going back into research. I was a 
cancer health educator at Moffitt Cancer Center and a partnership between um, Moffitt Cancer Center in, in Tampa, Florida and one of the medical schools in Puerto Rico. And within that particular project, uh, I was a member of the Outreach Corps, and we really wanted to identify ways to develop sustainable trainings for um, cancer community educators in Puerto Rico, where there's really a dearth of this. So this really gets to the importance of understanding, again, your audience and knowing when it's important to further tailor and what we call transcreate information to sub-ethnic groups or enclaves within a broader population. So we actually identified um, a train the trainer program that's been very successful across the US called Cancer 101. And we worked with community leaders and members of the community to tailor this particular program to audiences in Puerto Rico. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm gonna spare you the details, um, but as you can see here, the modules and all of the content really did change. In some areas, they changed a lot more than others based on the needs and the different disparities that the Latino community in Puerto Rico faces compared to other groups in the US. Uh, this is just an example of how it changed um, but then we also wanted to find a sustainable way. And I mentioned this, a, a sustainable way to, to continue to educate audiences. And I mentioned this because I know that as public health um, organizations and NGOs, sometimes we are strapped for time and we are strapped for people. And we need to identify ways that as researchers, we're not just coming in, doing research, publishing it and leaving. Right, we need to leave an investment. And when we can develop sustainable trainings that communities can use, that's the way to go. So we actually embedded this particular training program into the MPH program at the Ponce School of Medicine. And it's still going on today to train students to also deliver education in the community. We did so using uh, social cognitive theory to help with the training development and whatnot. And this has actually been standardized and it's, uh, it's a curriculum that's available online. So it, it stands on its own. And it's very important that, again, we're thinking creatively in ways to develop sustainability that also leverages the trust that's already been established in the community. Um, I have some examples here of how we can do these things on social media. We need to be, I, I firmly believe that mobile health um, initiatives and apps are super important. They're technologically important, but a lot of people are already on social media platforms and we need to be meeting our audiences where they are. So we need to do a better job of creating interventions that are also leveraging social media as a way to engage with and change behavior in different areas. So these are just some studies to point you to in case anyone's interested. And I wanted to end with just some lessons learned from all of this work um, and really re-emphasizing the previous two speakers. We need to make sure that we are as researchers and as practitioners listening to community leaders and working around their needs and their timelines. That's going to make us successful. That's also going to help bolster trust because we need to, myself as a Puerto Rican, I went home to work after Hurricane Maria. I knew that my identity as a Puerto Rican was trumped by the fact that these communities know what they need, right? So it's important that we are always having that open communication with community leaders who know their communities best. We want to um, make sure that our efforts are cult culturally sensitive and they work around available resources. We want to ensure that initiatives are engaged, active, and trustworthy with community partners, right? Especially when you're working from afar. And that's something that we've seen with COVID-19 um, happen even locally, where we've needed to think outside of the box and see how we can actually leverage partnerships and um, establish things remotely so that we're also still maintaining that presence, but doing so in a way that is abiding by other people's health um, needs. And then lastly, of course, communication with 
community needs to be consistent, trustworthy, and easy to use. We need to make sure that it's also continuous, right? That we are not just going in, doing something, leaving, and then coming back years later, um, because that is only going to further erode trust issues that we are seeing exacerbated today. Um, when our keynote was talking, I, I pulled up this slide really quick, thinking about where we go from here. I, I share this often. And uh, just to note that we are dealing with some massive public health issues right now. We are dealing with, uh, I don't wanna, we could call it an identity crisis that we are definitely solving, but it is going to take interdisciplinary and collaborative work. So I'm not gonna go into each of these boxes um, for just, just to be cognizant of time, but we really need to be doing things like this, having these types of conferences and these types of conversations to develop interdisciplinary platforms and multilingual and transnational collaborations, um, particularly with audiences like the Latino community. Uh, lastly here, some references, I'll make sure to plop them in the chat and uh, their videos and whatnot. Um, and thank you, muchas gracias. It's a pleasure and I can't wait for the Q&A later. <laughs>